like to call this meeting of the Elections Committee to order. Um, thank you, people, for coming here on a Wednesday evening, um, Tuesday evening, evening, <laughs> weeknight evening. We had a snowstorm, which I didn't think personally was that bad last week, but, uh, <laughs> but it did necessitate canceling a hearing, so I appreciate members' indulgence in holding this uh, rescheduled hearing tonight. Uh, the first order of business, a uh, quorum is present. I should mention that for the record. The first uh, item on the agenda is the approval of the minutes of the February 15th committee hearing. Anybody uh, feeling bold and like moving the uh, minutes? Uh, Representative Frederick has moved approval of the February 15th minutes. Uh, is there any discussion? Okay, seeing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, the minutes are adopted. The first bill on the agenda is House File 635. Representative Greenman, uh, would you like to move House 635 be recommended to be re-referred to the Public Safety Finance and Policy Committee? So moved, Mr. Chair. Okay, thank you. And uh, did you... You, you, there's an A1 amendment. Uh, is that just to put the bill in the shape you would like? Yes, uh, Mr. Chair. Okay. Yeah. Any discussion to the? Oh yeah. So yes, uh, uh, Representative Greenman moves the A1 amendment. Uh, is there any discussion to the amendment? Okay. Seeing none. All those in favor, please say aye. Hi. Aye. Opposed. Okay. The bill is in the shape. Uh, opposed. Okay. No. Nobody's opposed. The bill's <laughs> in the shape you would like. I'm sorry. I'm just. <laughs> out of my element because it's an evening here. So uh, the bill is in the shape you would like. Uh, Representative Greenman, please uh, describe your bill. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And it is, you know, 6.30 and I don't know if anybody else has eaten dinner. Um, but I'm really grateful to be here uh, today on a less snowy day um, to present 6.35, an election worker uh, protection act um, to support our election workers and our um, election system, the tens of thousands of Minnesotans um, who step up to run our elections each year. In Minnesota, we have a proud tradition of trusted and local elections administration. Every cycle, uh, 30,000 of our friends and neighbors in every community and every corner of our state pitch in to help and staff our polling places, prepare and send absentee ballots, and process and canvas the results. Uh, for some, they do it as a small portion of their life, um, of their year, and for some public servants, it's part of their job um, that they're doing for the county or the city around. In 2020, Minnesotans put in a heroic effort, in some cases putting their health on the line, to ensure communities had safe, secure, and well-run elections during a global pandemic. Since 2020 election, the January 6th insurrection rooted in lies of a stolen election, their job has only gotten tougher and the pressure more intense. Many of these Minnesotans are the same election workers who have done this work in their communities for years before 2020. For years, they've worked quietly in the background, efficiently doing their jobs for a, a smoothly running elections. These are private citizens doing apolitical work of conducting an election, but unfortunately in the last three years, the increasingly tense political environment, aggressive rhetoric, disinformation about elections and social media has involuntarily thrust these men and women into the public spotlight. This is happening around the country and here in Minnesota. Social media, heated rhetoric, disinformation about voting machines, and an irresponsible and misplaced targeting of local election um, and public servants have created and contributed to an increasing fear and insecurity amongst those who administer our elections. In some cases, uh, election workers have been directly targeted with credible threats. So looking at um, the last couple of years, we saw credible, and I will, I, I'm happy to provide the, the background, but in the interest of time, Credible threats, um, municipal clerks in Madison and executive director of the Milwaukee Election Commission in Philadelphia, commissioners and their elections officials received dozens of death threats, death threats some having to move their family. Secretary of State in Georgia, his family received the, uh, severe death threats, um, leading them to take precautions, including leaving their home. We've heard eight, at least eight secretaries of state, including our own, who've received threats that have um, uh, been brought to their home and their family. Um, this, of course, is the most severe, and there are many more of um, uh, less severe things. Across the country, examples like these and the fears surrounding them have impacted the folks who work in our elections and volunteer to conduct our elections. A 2022 Brennan Center survey of election officials reportedly reported that nearly one in six have experienced threats and three in four 
uh, three out of four election officials feel threats against local elections have increased in the recent years. The increasingly tense environment uh, and focus on elections officials have led to an increase in verbal threats and harassment, intimidation of folks for just doing their jobs. This has led many dedicated uh, folks who have been election judges for a year, elections administrators, uh, to think about leaving their work. According to that survey, one in five elections officials are unlikely to continue serving in 2024. In Minnesota, uh, we have faced a wave of retirements from election administrators and election judges. And we have seen efforts to tamper and interfere with infrastructure of our elections. In Colorado, Georgia, and Michigan, we saw deeply troubling and illegal efforts, many leading to indictments, driven by the, the big lie of a stolen election. We saw clerks and party officials attempt to provide unauthorized access to voting system technology and voter lists. We're grateful here in Minnesota that election workers have not yet faced the same level of intimidation and threats that we've seen in Arizona, in Wisconsin, in Michigan, in Pennsylvania, in Colorado, in Georgia, and other places. But we must not be naive. Unfortunately, the problem is growing and the pattern is a national trend. It's leading to a growing anxiety in the tens of thousands of Minnesotans who administer our elections. In the last three years, we've seen that through an uptick of, of retirements. We have the opportunity here in Minnesota to act together to show our local elections administrators and our local elections officials, those 30,000 folks, uh, that this conduct, threats, interference, intimidation is unacceptable. We saw, we can say clearly that intentional interference or tampering with machines and our voter lists will not be tolerated. We can do that through this bill, which provides protections for election workers and their official duties and by safeguarding the functions of elections administration from interference. It protects election workers and ensures they have the legal tools to do their sacred job of administering our elections without intimidation and interference. If you look at the bill, it protects them from intimidation, like death threats and threats of physical violence and coercion. It includes protection so that election officials can do their jobs free of interference or obstruction, like blocking access to polling places or efforts to give gain on authorized entry to secure uh, locations, and it protects election officials from doxing that could lead to unauthorized disclosures of the personal information. It also, and because of what we've seen in the last couple of years, tamper or protects critical infrastructure of our elections, including uh, prohibition against tampering with voter equipment and unauthorized access, tampering with ballot boxes and, uh, um, and drop boxes, tampering with voter registration lists and polling place rosters, and unauthorized access to the state voter registration system. Much of this bill builds on language from the Minnesota statutes that are already on the books in different places to protect other public servants, voters, other important legal processes. And over the last two years, we've heard this bill been soliciting feedback from local elections administrators, some you might hear from tonight, prosecutors, national elections experts, and the Secretary of State to tailor the language and the remedies to protect those workers and prohibit behavior targeting um, our uh, um, workers in our election administration. These folks didn't sign up to this job for public glory and don't expect, didn't expect it to put a target on their back. We can take a firm stand here together, uh, protecting them and rising against this threat and give law enforcement the tools they need and elections officials the tools they need to protect themselves um, and do their job, their sacred job. So I'd urge you um, um, to listen to our testifiers. Um, I would love to have your support and with that, Mr. Chair, I believe we have some testifiers. Sure. Thank you, Representative Greenman. Um, the first testifier I have who's signed up is Secretary of State Steve Simon. Uh, welcome to the committee, Secretary Simon. Please identify yourself and proceed with your testimony. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members. Thank you for having me. I want to thank Representative Greenman as well, uh, Steve Simon, Minnesota Secretary of State. It's a pleasure to be here. I wish on some level that I didn't need to be here uh, because I wish we didn't need this bill. But unfortunately, we do need this bill and we need it in Minnesota. Over the last few years, we have seen a noticeable uptick in conduct towards elections administrators that is not merely abusive, but that is threatening and harassing. It is so significant nationwide that the FBI and the Department of Justice have convened a task force on the subject. It's a task force that our office tracks. I myself have participated in the group's deliberations. 
Um, the problem is so serious that a new national group has formed uh, called the Election Official Legal Defense Network. It is co-chaired by the former chief lawyer for the Republican National Committee, Ben Ginsburg, and the former chief lawyer for the Democratic National Committee, Bob Bauer. They are the core chairs. It is totally nonpartisan, totally bipartisan. I serve on the advisory board. They're doing great work. So what about Minnesota? Is this just some national problem and, and not something that we should be particularly concerned about in Minnesota? Well, in Minnesota, sadly, it is also an issue. And it's important that we address it early because we need professional workers in all ranks of elections. We need the professional elections administrators, as Representative Greenman would say, uh, was talking about. But we also need 30,000 people every election to sign up to be election judges. 30,000. That's a lot. And they need to be convinced that it's a safe and secure environment. So let me give you some Minnesota examples in case you think uh, that maybe this is just theoretical or this is hypothetical. Let me give you three real Minnesota examples that I've heard over the last uh, many months. I'm not going to name the people and I'm not going to name the counties, but these are three examples. One person told me, this is an election administrator, chief election administrator in a Minnesota county, told me that uh, an election worker on her staff was followed to her car after hours in the parking ramp by someone who is very agitated and angry and upset over an elections related issue. Another elections administrator in a county told me that she herself was harassed numerous times on her home phone over the weekend by a voter who was agitated or angry or upset about an elections related issue. Yet a third person, third totally separate county, told me personally this one was the most recent one. This came just this last December. She told me that she was physically accosted in her office uh, by a voter, a constituent, someone in the county who, again, was upset or angry or agitated by an election-related issue. Got, it was so bad that they had to uh, press the panic alarm and have uh, the sheriff's office, which fortunately was in that building, come up and intervene and help separate the two. So l let me just say a word about the First Amendment. I think we can all agree um, we don't want to touch it. We don't want any uh, legislation that would um, uh, come close to to uh, violating the First Amendment. And I want to say for my own, uh, my own view is it's every citizen's right, every citizen's right to be angry at those of us in government, everyone in this room, uh, legislators, me, staff, anyone. It's their right to shake a fist in the air at us. It's their right to use salty language. It's their right to raise their voice. It's not always pleasant to be on the other end of it, as some of you know firsthand, I'm sure. Uh, but that it is what it is. That's our democracy. And if uh, people are worried about their tender feelings being hurt, maybe they're in the wrong line of work in the sense that sometimes you get people who are upset or mad or skeptical or uh, frustrated, and that's okay. But what we're talking about here isn't just speech or belief. We're talking about conduct, conduct that can interfere in, um, in the administration of an election and conduct that is on its face um, harassing, threatening, and intimidating, not just animated, not just angry. That's okay. It always is okay. And I think the problem here is that um, if we don't step in, we're going to see more people, both administrators and election judges, not wanting to do this work. And we have something special in Minnesota, as Representative Greenman said. Our elections are run at the local level. We're highly decentralized, unlike some states. Our office, we never count ballots. We don't own any of the elections equipment. We don't hire, train, or pay any of the election judges, ever. That all happens at the local level. And the folks who do that work in your counties and cities and townships are some of the best people at that job in the country. I can say that absolutely. They are ethical. They are honest. They are fair. They are accurate. And we need to protect them. And this bill does that. So thanks for your time and attention. Hope to have your support. Thank you for your testimony, Secretary Simon. Uh, the next testifier who signed up is uh, former representative and current Dakota County Commissioner Lori Halverson. Uh, welcome back to the House, <laughs> Commissioner Halverson. Please uh, identify yourself for the record and proceed with your testimony. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members of the committee. Uh, I am Lori Halverson, Dakota County Commissioner, and it is uh, truly an honor to be back in the, ele in the Elections Committee where I uh, had the pleasure of serving for several years. Um, I am here today to testify in support of Representative Greenman's bill, House File 635. Um, I'm here on behalf of the Association of Minnesota Counties, an organization that represents all 87 counties throughout the state of Minnesota. 
Minnesota has a long and proud history of open, transparent, and fair elections. We also have um, the, the great honor of being one of the states with the highest voter participation in the nation. We like our number one position whenever we have it, which is frequent um, in terms of our voter turnout, which says a lot about how our citizens feel about our elections, that they um, are uh, well run and professional and that the outcomes are uh, fair and true. Um, however, in the past several years, um, a lot of doubt has been um, cast upon elections um, without, frankly, evidence. And it has come home to roost at the most local level. One of the hallmarks, I think, of our democracy and the way elections are run in Minnesota is that it is, as the secretary said, a really local event. It is a neighborhood event. This is where our neighbors are coming out and volunteering to help us run elections, um, to uh, work in a bipartisan fashion, to uh, make sure that the checks are there and the confidence is there for the voters casting their ballots. And we are proud as Minnesotans to wear our I Voted stickers. I don't know how long you guys carry those things around, but it'll be months or years that my I Voted sticker is, is um, attached to something um, that I'm carrying. At the same time, um, we have seen a rise in inflammatory remarks, in misinformation, um, and accusations directed at um, our local volunteers and our local staff. And as an elected representative from Dakota County um, who has seen, um, overseen um, elections, um, it really troubles me to see um, the vitriol that has been um, focused on our staff and our volunteers in Dakota County. Um, frankly, they don't deserve what they have been subjected to in Dakota County. Um, we have had staff um, who were erroneously accused um, and there was a whisper campaign or about criminal activity, um, which was false um, and um, was a very hard rumor to, to squelch. I personally have been asked for the home um, contact information for our local election judges, which is private and protected information. But the fact is it says that um, our local volunteers are being targeted not at their place of business, not even in their role um, as a, a public volunteer, but at their homes where they're with their families, um, where they should feel safe all the time. And our uh, election leaders at the county believe that 2024 will bring as much or more of this um, type of targeting and behavior of our local elected officials. There is great concern. And I've talked to local elected officials around um, the country. And um, there is a terrible time, of, uh, terrible turnover around the country with election staff. Um, it is uh, hard uh, to find the volunteers that we need. And um, we really need to make sure that our public uh, servants feel the protections that they deserve. So with that, I just want to thank the committee for hearing this bill, for considering um, protecting our local elected, or excuse me, our local volunteers and, and staff. And I want to say that on behalf of Minnesota's county commissioners statewide, we have expressed um, unequivocal support um, and trust in our uh, local public servants. And the bill that is in front of you today we don't want it to get used, but we do want it to be there because um, it sends a very clear message that no one can interfere um, with the integrity of our elections and with the um, wonderful service that our volunteers and staff provide um, to make sure that Minnesota's elections are fair and free. Thank you for your testimony, Commissioner Halverson. Uh, next on the list, I have Michael Stahlberger. And after Michael Stahlberger will be David Fisher. So uh, if you want to get ready. Uh, Mr. Chair? Yes, uh, uh, Representative Quam. Thank you. Um, most of the committees I'm on have a list of, of testifiers so then we can, you know, have their name and we can, you know, take notes net to that. Uh, is there a reason why we don't have that on our agendas? Uh, thank you, Re uh, Representative Quam. Uh, I'm not aware that most committees provide that um, I can certainly 
talk to staff about providing that in the future. I'm certainly not trying to hide anything or uh, from from you, but uh, uh, I'm you know I have it here on like an annotated agenda, but I I'm, I haven't seen it on the agenda in other committees. Maybe some committees do it, but well, Mr. Chair, I've I am I'm used to that, so maybe it's the the ones that I I get put on they uh, try to help me out and make it easier to. See, but thank you. Sure, no, understood. We'll, I'll discuss it with staff after the meeting. So, thank you for the suggestion. Uh, welcome to the committee. Um, uh, please, uh, please identify yourself and proceed with your testimony. Sure, Mr. <laughs> Chair, members of the committee. Uh, good evening. My name is Michael Stolberger, and I'm director of property and environmental resources for Blue Earth County, Minnesota. Uh, my department is responsible for administering elections for about 40,000 registered voters, among many other uh, responsibilities and functions assigned to our department. I'm here today on behalf of the Minnesota Association of County Officers. MACO represents all 87 counties' auditors, treasurers, recorders, and finance officers, including all of the county's elections administrators. Our association, in conjunction with the Association of Minnesota Counties, the League of Minnesota Cities, and the Minnesota Association of Townships, have submitted a supportive written testimony uh, due to our shared responsibility for administering elections. The fact that all four of our associations share a common position on this bill underscores the importance we see in having resources and mechanisms in place that will further support the security of our election system statewide. Uh, MACO as an association creates a legislative platform and priorities list every year, and we've built this year's uh, platform on a series of guiding principles. One of those principles we hold dear is a fair and impartial stewardship of elections. We want to support any legislative efforts that enhance the efficiency, the administration, and security of elections statewide. We feel many provisions of House File 635 further those goals and the principles of MACO's membership. Uh, the bill provides a definition for permitted and prohibited activities and behaviors of elections officials and uh, people who are inter interacting with the elections process. It has an impact on elections officials' performance of our duties, and that is something that we hold very dear. It provides our staff and our valued election judges and volunteers some confidence in their security and protection from, from harassment as well. For that reason, MACO is supportive of the bill. Uh, to maximize your time, I will focus on Section 4, and if you uh, would like me to, I can provide some data from uh, county elections officials who completed a survey related to their experiences with the past couple of elections and any instances they might have had with voter intimidation and whatnot. But I'll leave that to your discretion at the end, Mr. Chair. <coughs> uh, but in, when we refer to Section 4 of the bill, uh, we do see uh, many provisions in there that will give us some pretty clear guidance on, on how uh, to educate our election judges and also how to make sure that we can provide them with a sense of security. As I read Section 4, uh, it, uh, it gives us prohibitions on a variety of conducts toward and by elections officials. Uh, it also includes our canvassing boards, our ballot board members, and as we've mentioned, our election judges. That clarity and statute is going to provide us with level and clear expectations for behaviors that will be deemed acceptable and appropriate in a polling place and amongst our elections administrators. It also ad addresses concerns that I've heard personally from our fellow administrators, as well as election judges specifically in Blue Earth County who uh, do come to me with questions and concerns about their safety and security while serving as an election judge. At conferences and at other meetings with elections administrators, we do hear concern about intimidation and that it is rising above what is considered active or engaged questioning. Uh, we, we do have uh, concerns and we do hear concerns from elections administrators related to their safety in the upcoming elections. Fortunately, I have not experienced any of this myself. So when I hear others speak of that, it is something that I, I take very uh, personally uh, as my colleagues and as my friends in the industry. Um, I haven't experienced, as I mentioned, uh, we do have election judges that have brought concerns to me directly. I've had election judges that I've had to remove from assignment because of actions that they've um, tried to undertake as part of their, their service as an election judge. And this bill provides us with some clarity and some information that will, will help us better administer the election and uphold the laws of the state of Minnesota. As I said, Mr. Chair, I can uh, go into detail about a survey that we sent out uh, if you'd like to hear more specific information, but I wanted to be respectful of your time. Thank you. I feel like we've had pretty thorough testimony, but if you're able to uh, send it to myself and our committee administrator, Simon Brown, we can make sure every member of the committee gets, gets it. So, but I do appreciate the offer. So, would that conclude your testimony then? That is all I have, sir. Um, I am available for questions if you have any. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Uh, the next testifier is uh, David Fisher, and after David Fisher will be Charlie Schmidt. Uh, welcome to the committee, David Fisher. Please, uh, once you've 
come to the table. Please identify yourself and proceed with your testimony. Very good. <coughs> Mr. Chair, members of the committee, my name is David Fisher. I uh, teach law school at the Minnesota University of Minnesota Law School, and I'm a former Minnesota Commissioner of Administration. And I'm here on behalf of Clean Action or Clean Elections Minnesota in support of House File 635. You know, over the last few years, I've been alarmed by harassment of election officials around the nation and right here in Minnesota, as Representative Greenman has already outlined. And this abuse has fallen on officials regardless of their party affiliation, on ordinary people simply doing their jobs. It threatens the very foundation of our democracy, the power of our vote, and decries defies Abraham Lincoln's charge at Gettysburg for a government of the people, by the people, for the people. And that's why I signed on as an election judge in Hennepin County this last year and have performed those duties. And we need your help. We can't have a secure democracy if we don't protect the security of people who administer, protect, and stand guard over our elections. We have a code calling for election officials to con conduct their business in an environment and in a manner that favorably reflects values of fairness, accessibility, accountability, and effectiveness. To uphold and increase the public trust and confidence in elections and to support our constitution. We are dedicated to simply doing the work of democracy, yet we're caught in a crossfire. Representative Green has already detailed the extent of the abuse to, to an extent. She's mentioned the Brennan Center, uh, report, Brennan Center report. And I also wanted to add that as of December 2021, Reuters has documented over 850 threatening messages targeting election officials since the 2020 election. Clean Elections Minnesota is concerned now about attracting and retaining the thousands of good people needed to serve as election officials from all party affiliations and backgrounds. And we worry about the destabilizing effect that this will have on a Minnesota election system that is a national model of integrity, openness, and civil order. We have strong precedent in Minnesota for tough penalties, for threats to public officials and public safety. For those who would seek to hijack or vandalize our secure election system, this especially cannot be tolerated. House File 635 is a fitting response to those who threaten our democracy, not only our right to vote, but the ability to accurately count and record those votes without fear or favor. For these reasons, we urge you to support House File 635. Thank you, Mr. Chair and, and committee. Yep. Thank you for your testimony. And the final testifier who signed up in advance is Charlie Schmidt. Welcome to the committee. Uh, once you've gotten to the table, please identify yourself for the record and then proceed with your testimony. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you to the members of the committee for giving me time to speak today. My name is Charlie Schmidt. I'm a junior at Washburn High School in Minneapolis, and I'm currently serving on the Minnesota Youth Council. I'm here today to speak in support of House File 635. During the 2022 election cycle, I worked as a student election judge in Minneapolis alongside two of my closest friends. We went to the training together, did our election judging together, and we took our breaks together. During the day, we were also helping run the social media page for uh, the Minneapolis Elections Network, and we were also interviewed on TV. Um, during the day, we felt safe and appreciated. I'm gay, and one of my friends who worked with me is also gay, and we were never subjected to any hate or any bigotry for the way we live our lives. After the elections, I heard, heard stories of election judges being intimidated across the country, and specifically examples of intimidation in Minnesota. As someone who plans on serving as an election judge in the future, it is reassuring to know that bills like this one are being considered, because I never want to be in a situation where I'm uncomfortable as an election judge. My colleagues, neighbors, and community members who work as election judges, administrators, and poll workers are doing important work to ensure our elections are free and fair, and we deserve to be treated with respect and enjoy a welcoming environment. I can safely say that election judging was one of the best jobs I've had, and I would for sure do it again in the future. It also helped me pay for my Taylor Swift ticket. <laughs> <laughs> I'm here today to make sure that everyone in the future can have just as good of an experience as my friends and I did. I'm here to make sure that no matter your identity, race, gender, sexuality, etc., you will feel safe and respected as an election judge. Voting is the most sacred duty we have as citizens of this great democracy, and as election judges, it's our job to make sure that the process of voting is as safe and as easy as possible. 
Overall, this bill puts in place basic rules and makes being an election judge safer while also guaranteeing the integrity of our state's voters. I implore you to vote yes on House Files 635 today, not just for me, but also for future election workers to ensure they have just as good an experience as I did. Thank you for your time. Yep. Thank you for your testimony. Um, do, are there any members of the public who wish to testify on this bill? Okay, seeing none, I'll close the public hearing. Before we turn to member discussion, I just want to point out, um, I apologize. Uh, there was an oversight and we neglected to, there was a fiscal note prepared. Um, it was available on February 23rd, which is when it's dated. We, because uh, of an oversight, we neglected to post it on the uh, committee website. It's been emailed to all members. Um, it does show a uh, $400,000 cost to the Attorney General, which I assume is the number that would go in the dots on line 5.20. Uh, did you want to say anything about that, uh, Representative Greenman, before we proceed? Or? Uh, I guess what I could say, because folks have seen actually this before. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, as you, if you look at the estimates, um, they are um, I, almost identical to what we saw in House File 3 um, under the Attorney General's um, uh, jurisdiction, because they're basically estimating the same kind of thing. So you have seen this number before. It's, uh, it's $200,000 in um, each biennium. Um, there is a question um, that, that I think we've raised with the Attorney General of whether we think it'll actually be this much, but it is a fiscal note that actually should look very similar to the fiscal note that you've seen before. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, at some point, we generally put numbers in, in place of the dots. Uh, it seemed from the discussion from the chair that they may actually have the numbers to put in place of the dots. Um, is there an intent to do a technical uh, oral amendment to do that? Uh, thank you, Representative Quam. Uh, I guess. Oh, I'm getting a thumbs up from uh, Representative Greenman. Um, yeah. I, I think that would be a technical amendment. So should. Thank yeah. you, Mr. Assuming, Chair. And thank yeah. you, Representative. Uh, um, Representative Greenman. Um, I'm looking at you, Lee Torkelson. I mean, if, if, the, <laughs> if you would be okay with that, I think that um, I would appreciate doing that here. We could also do it at the next stop, but um, happy to do that here and anticipate it will be that number. So, Mr. Chair, Lee Torkelson, we're on the edge of our seat. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for waking me up. Uh, um, I, yeah, it's fine. Uh, it's uh, a little surprised we didn't have the information sooner. Um, I was looking through my pages here because luckily my researcher had the information uh, ahead of the committee. I don't know why you wouldn't put it in, but it's your bill, uh, Representative Greenman. So uh, I would expect if you want it in, you would make the motion. Thank you, uh, Lee Torkelson, and thank you, Mr. Chair. And actually, um, looking at it, it would be a $200,000 in fiscal year 2024. So I would, is my verbal, is my motion for a verbal amendment to insert $200,000 in line 5.20 after the dollar sign? Uh, Mr. Gehring, um, maybe just have you restate, it? Uh, restate the <laughs> amendment. Just for the record. Uh, Mr. Chair, uh, Representative Greenman, yes. So, so I think you could, on line 5.20, you could delete the dots and insert $200,000. Although, Mr. Chair, I think I might defer to Ms. Roberts because the one thing I'm noticing here is that the fiscal note uh, includes costs for both, both fiscal 24 and fiscal 25. And as drafted, this is only an appropriation for fiscal 24. Uh, uh, Ms. Roberts. Yeah, Mr. Chair and members, that's correct. Um, I think you would also need to add, um, as, after, uh, on line 5.20 after line um, 2024, delete the is and say, and 200,000 in fiscal year 25, 2025 are appropriated from the general fund to cover both years. And then it would continue into the base for the attorney general. Okay. All right, I think, all right, any discussion to that? <coughs> okay. Okay. Yeah. Um, Matt Gehring, could you maybe Restate it one more time, just so it's clear on the record. Uh, sure, Mr. Chair. So then, with the amendment, uh, line 5.20 of the of the bill would read: two hundred thousand dollars in fiscal year 2024 and two hundred thousand dollars in fiscal year 25 are appropriated from the general fund to the attorney general 
support enforcement of Minnesota statute section 211B.076. Okay. All right, any discussion? Okay, seeing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, uh, the amendment is adopted. Um, any additional member discussion to the bill? Representative Plum? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And I, I'm wondering what uh, uh, protections or how is this going to decrease the opportunity if somebody uh, sees a, a violation from speaking up? Uh, Representative Greenman. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Representative Kwam. Um, no, I think that if you look in each of these places, like for instance, in the first, um, in 2.4, uh, um, it allows the county um, auditor municipal, municipal, municipal clerk to remove someone if they engage in negligent uh, duty, um, malfeasance or misconduct in office um, or for cause. I think in, in what you will see is there is for cause um, and requirements throughout um, the behavior in order to, uh, um, in order to ensure that what we're really trying to do is create a clear line of standard of conduct um, of what is and is not permissible. In, in most cases in this bill, um, um, especially when we're looking at the intimidation of election workers, we're actually taking that language um, from other places where we have it in statute uh, protecting other behavior. Um, so um, I feel really comfortable with the bill that it is, it is drawing a clear line. Okay. Uh, Representative Kwam. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I, you know, my, my concern is that there have been uh, cases where, well, one example is the head election judge uh, took ballots from the polling location, uh, burned them in her fireplace, and somebody had an issue, uh, but it really, nothing happened until there happened to be a recount because it was a close election it was close enough to where you didn't have to use all your fingers and toes to count the difference, but there were more uh, ballots that were taken and burned. The election judge said, well, they, they, they were uh, um, uh, flawed or, or bad ballots, and um, it ended up in the court being decided, well, because it was only one and a half times and it was close, uh, we're not going to change the, uh, the the outcome, even though that was sufficient to to cause you know it was more more ballots than the difference between the the votes. So um, I I would think that uh, adding the protections and having something in your bill that actually uh, showed uh, um, that this doesn't mean that you can't call out, you know, obvious violations and, uh, you know, strengthen the responsiveness because, again, that was ignored until there was a, uh, uh, a recount. Um, the other thing, what about intimidation of an election judge by another election official, Mr. Chair? Uh, Representative Greenman. Um, so uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, uh, Representative Quam, I am not familiar with the experience, but um, I would assume that that should have been immediately uh, um, <coughs> alerting uh, law enforcement. So in that front, front currently, um, there are uh, opportunities like the one you explained, if it, if it was a violation, uh, to bring to law enforcement. That's what we're trying to do, both uh, prevent the kind of conduct. Um, part of this is proactively preventing conduct, so giving clear lines. That's why there's civil enforcement as opposed to criminal enforcement. We don't just want to wait until something bad happens and then have criminal enforcement. We also want to try to prevent uh, um, uh, behavior. So uh, doxing, which we've heard about, uh, um, uh, um, uh, I think we heard testimony about uh, fear of your private information. Um, and in this, the, the doxing language is the same language that we adopted um, in 2019 as it relates to police officers. There was a similar concern. Um, and so this whole uh, provision is really about um, ensuring that, um, that we have clear lines for both on the criminal side, um, if behavior happens and you would have to improve intent um, and, and the elements of the crime, but also on the civil side uh, to prevent uh, um, the damage from being done. Uh, 
uh, Representative Quam. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Well, no, I, I'd like to repeat my question that that wasn't wasn't answered. What about intimidation of an election judge by another election official? Uh, Representative Greenman. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, this doesn't actually say who it doesn't have a provision of who's doing the intimidating. So if the language, if, if an election uh, 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 administrator is doing this behavior in subdivision two, it just says a person may not directly or indirectly. So whether it's a, a, an election administrator, what you would have to prove is that this kind of behavior um, is happening, but it doesn't, um, it doesn't specify who uh, the conduct is coming from. Uh, Representative Kwong. Uh, th thank you, Mr. Chair. The specific instance, and there was a, uh, uh, a complaint filed, a long-term uh, county employee that over many elections was part of the group that you work the elections mentioned that during uh, a procedure with absentee ballots that aren't we supposed to have two people there the head county election official said we're going to count all ballots you don't seem like a team player why don't you just go home and when that person arrived at home received a phone call that that person, she was no longer allowed to participate in any election activity. So, um, you know, this would be the intimidation of the head county election official on a judge that, that was quoting procedure and why aren't we following it? Um, and I would take that as being intimidation to an election judge um, and if that, yeah, that's an area of where we should not have any of our election personnel scared to say, well, aren't we supposed to do this, you know, to make sure that there aren't any oopses, oh, we, we messed up and we, we forgot to do this or that. Um, so I'm trying to understand how your bill would address this situation and it was from uh, a couple of elections ago. And so it's sort of predated a lot of the, uh, you know, massive uh, media and other activities. Um, but, you know, and, and again, both these instances, I haven't mentioned what counties, although the first one, it'd be pretty easy to, to look up. There aren't that many court cases like that, but um, yeah, I. When we do a bill, I want to make sure um, that we look at all the possible iterations of, of activity and we address and we don't have, you know, we've got, you know, more complete, thorough, and then also some balance because I, I want none of our election officials to be uh, reluctant to ask a question if they're concerned about, you know, some issue especially someone that ha has been at multiple elections. Thank you, Representative Quam. Any additional member discussion? Representative Frederick. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, just for context for the committee, I'd like to point out that the story that was just shared is referencing or going back to 2002. Uh, and it sounds like a miscommunication and some other things that were going wrong where the bill before us is about uh, harassment of election workers uh, in that we want to make sure that workers are free from bullying and intimidation and that they are safe to be able to um, oversee our elections administration along with the equipment that uh, is being used to ensure the integrity of the equipment as well. Uh, and so the counting of ballots is a separate issue, one that I think everyone can get behind that wants to make sure it's done in a correct way but doesn't directly tie to the bill uh, before us. Mr. Chair. Representative Plum. Um the issue where the county head, head county election official is definitely not from 2002. It's from after I was elected in 2010, and it was a couple of elections ago. So, I, again, I don't want to specify the exact names in the county and, and get into that. So um, I just want to let you know that you're incorrectly inferring 
the case and and maybe there's another case maybe there are a lot of cases where there have been issues but this is about the bill if my understanding is correctly is to protect election judges and personnel from intimidation it should not matter where that intimidation comes from and it surely should cover intimidation from within the system otherwise if we're okay with some intimidation then we really have big problems thank you uh, representative Quam. i think just to what uh, representative greenman said earlier it uses the term a person so if it meets the threshold defined in the bill it would apply to um, an election supervisor as well um, if as long as it meets the the qualities spelled out in the bill is there any additional member discussion okay uh, seeing none uh, represent Greenman you're welcome to respond and then just move if you'd like uh, or just move to your uh, closing statement um, well thank you mr. chair um, and thank you particularly to our testifiers um, I've been working on this bill um, now for two years um, and really um, from the input and the um, um, uh, the input the stories the technical expertise of our election workers of our uh, election judges of our elections administrators like uh, uh, mr. Stahlberg and others who have really been thinking about what 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 do we need to ensure that we are uh, continuing to offer safe, secure elections, and what do we do in this environment? Uh, do we need to protect our elections, um, uh, our election system, and our elections administration? Um, so I would, um, uh, I think that it would strand. A, I, I really hope, um, um, as I think was was mentioned, this is sort of nonpartisan protection. Um, we are talking about folks who are uh, both nonpartisan and Republican and Democratic election judges who have all voiced these concerns. So this is absolutely an issue that's about protecting um, all of the folks who do this work in Minnesota. Um, and so I uh, uh, look forward to um, uh, uh, the vote um, and the continuing the conversation. I know that uh, Lee Torgelson and I had a conversation a long time ago, um, but if there's additional conversations that you want to have uh, Representative Quam to make sure that we are protecting um, those folks and we're protecting the infrastructure. I think that that's really important and that's what we've heard today. So um, with that, I would ask you for your support. Thank you. With that, Representative Greenman renews the motion that House File 635 as amended be recommended to be re-referred to the Public Safety Finance and Policy Committee. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Uh, next bill on the agenda is House File 495, Representative Purcell. Uh, would you, once, once you've gotten to the testifying table, uh, would you like to move that House File 495 be recommended to be re-referred to the Higher Education Finance and Policy Committee? So moved, Mr. Chair. Okay. Uh, Representative Purcell moves House File 495 be referred to the Higher Education Finance and Policy Committee. Um, did you want to move the DE1 amendment at this point? Uh, yes. I would love to move my amendment to get the bill in the shape I would like it. Okay. Uh, any discussion to the amendment? Okay, seeing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, the bill's in the shape you would like. Uh, Representative Purcell, please describe your bill. Thank you, Mr. Chair. <laughs> House File 495 is an opportunity to ensure college students are able to cast a ballot, perhaps for the first time. The first time I was eligible to vote, I remember how excited I was to have a voice in our state's future and in our democracy. Participating in Minnesota politics is a great way to increase students' interest and engagement in the future of Minnesota a state that perhaps they grew up in or perhaps they'll choose to stay here if they came from out of state. Regardless of where college students live, if they are eligible, students should be able to vote. Currently, post-secondary schools that receive federal or state aid have the option to prepare a list of students living on campus and or within 10 miles of campus. This list is prepared and sent to county auditors to use for election day registration. This bill makes this requirement mandatory for all schools receiving state aid. House File 495 clarifies the timelines, training of election judges, and creates a uniform experience for the students who live in qualified housing. You have letters of support in your packet, and I have testifiers on hand as well, um, but I wanted to just quote a brief snippet from eight highly engaged St. Olaf students, my constituents, uh, who wrote to me and said, quote, college students are passionate about participating in our democracy. Their voice is essential to the discourse on many issues touching communities around Minnesota. 
College students conduct leading research into the quality of water, the effects of climate change, political dynamics, and societal changes writ large. We must support their right to participate in Minnesota's electoral process. Too many barriers exist for college students to participate in our democracy. This procedural change can significantly decrease an institutional barrier that discourages or prevents college students from voting. We wholly support this measure to protect the right to vote for college students and ask the body to consider our opinion. Special thanks to Brock, India, Grace, Donovan, Maya, Will, Sophie, and Josh. Uh, and I can uh, open it up to my testifiers. I guess perhaps uh, let me let me do a few clarifying pieces on the bill and with the amendment as well. Okay, excuse me. Um, so the amendment uh, makes a clarifying change that the onus is on the schools to provide the list per federal regulations of the Family Educational Rights and Privacy Act, FERPA. So under FERPA, post-secondary institutions must allow students the option to opt out of this information disclosure. Um, that was a, a additional piece that we put in with that um, DE1 amendment. And now I'd like to invite Testify. Sure. Thank you, uh, Representative Purcell. I have uh, Sean Lim uh, on the list to testify. Uh, welcome to the committee. When, uh, Sean Lim, once you've gotten to the table, please identify yourself uh, for the record and then proceed with your testimony. <coughs> Thank you. Uh, good evening, Chair Freiberg and members of the committee. Thank you for having me. My name is Sean Lim. My pronouns are he, him, and I am the program director at the Minnesota Youth Collective. We are an organization that builds the political power of young people across the state of Minnesota with an emphasis on youth-dense neighborhoods and college campuses statewide, including St. Olaf. Um, I'm here today to testify in favor of Rep Purcell's <coughs> student voting bill, HF 9495, uh, which would effectively modify the student, student uh, voter registration provisions and require post-secondary institutions to provide student housing lists within a 10-mile radius so that students are guaranteed to be able to register with their student IDs. Um, many schools, like the U of M Twin Cities campus, already do this, but this bill would bring uh, every post-secondary institution in line with this best practice to make sure that all students are guaranteed the same ability to register with their student ID. Um, having this as a standard practice eliminates any confusion and would allow for a streamlined voter education and information sharing on campus. <coughs> I am a <coughs> proponent of this bill because <coughs> I've had many students come to me and be unsure of what they need to bring with them to the ballot box and other points of confusion or difficulty, especially for freshmen who have recently moved to or from uh, student housing, dorms, and apartments alike. Many college students, for example, don't know that they need uh, or need to bring a physical proof of residence like a housing lease or utility bill to their polling place in order to update their voter registration uh, information in person same day day of uh, or last minute. So point blank, the uh, matter, the fact of the matter is that uh, higher education institutions like the U of M, like other schools, already have all of our relevant information. They have our addresses, our full names, our uh, proof of residence, and for countless students that I've talked to using their uh, student ID or U card to vote um, as they have it in their wallet or lanyard, as a form of ID has made it infinitely easier for them and they don't have to go all the way back to their dorm to get stuff. So as such, this provision would also save time for election judges and greatly mitigate the long lines that we have seen, uh, especially in youth dense neighborhoods in college campuses. Young voters already don't turn out as much as other voter blocks. That is why I do the work that I do. And this is a step in the right direction um, it assists first-time voters, especially those on college campuses and students in having their voices heard and reflected in our democracy. I urge you all to support HF uh, 495 and protect our democracy by expanding it. Thank you for your time and consideration. Thank you for your testimony. Um, are there any members of the public who would like to testify on this bill? Okay. Sure, welcome back to the committee. Uh, if you could just once again state your name and uh, proceed with your testimony. 
Sure, again, thank you. Uh, my name is Michael Stolberger, Director of Property and Environmental Resources for Blue Earth County, uh, representing the Minnesota Association of County Officials. Uh, we decided to add some testimony on this bill uh, because among our guiding principles, we also uh, strive for continuous improvement in, in better services. And as we read through House File 495, we believe it does that. It essentially codifies some language that largely exists in Minnesota rules already, but adds some clarity around those provisions. Uh, this list, we refer to it as our college student housing list, uh, provides an effective and secure method for college students who present appropriate photo identification. Um, in Blue Earth County, we're home to uh, Minnesota State University Mankato, as well as Bethany Lutheran College. In the past, both of these uh, schools participated in this program. However, they've, uh, they have not been able to participate the last election because of some data practices issues that this bill will also help with. Uh, what we have found in past uh, elections is that this list really ensures that our election judges are registering voters at the correct and current address, and it provides a way for them uh, to be more efficiently processed through the election day registration process, reducing the voter lines, and also um, allowing our election judges to have some assurances that those students uh, are being registered at the correct address. Um, we still require all of the, the correct uh, documentation. Uh, they still have to identify themselves with a student ID or other photo ID. Uh, what this does is it really hones in on their place where they actually reside for election purposes and gives us better elections uh, data uh, entered into our voter registration systems. Uh, for those reasons, we do support this piece of uh, legislation. Uh, we do think it would in, it make our elections processes more efficient. And then also as a side note, it would reduce the amount of uh, vouched for voters on election day because it gives them an option to be uh, actually uh, documented at an address uh, through a list provided by a government agency. So with that, um, I will wrap up my testimony, but I can answer any questions if folks have questions about the act of practicalities of this. Thank you. Uh, for your testimony. Yeah, why don't you stick around in case there are any questions for you. Um, and my apologies, I understand Secretary Simon wanted to testify on this bill as well. So uh, welcome back to the committee. Um, Secretary Simon, if you could just identify yourself and proceed with your testimony. Sure, thank you, Mr. Chair and Member Steve Simon, Minnesota Secretary of State. I wanna thank Representative Purcell for carrying this bill. I think it's um, a really important cornerstone of participation for college students. Uh, you know, um, um, the last testifier uh, said much of what I was gonna say, so I'm not gonna repeat it. The only thing I will add that I think is new is, you know, when you think about voter registration, generally we're talking about two things in Minnesota. Anyone who registers to vote has to show somehow that they are who they say they are and they live where they say they live, both. Putting on the shelf for a moment the are who they say they are part, that can be accomplished through a variety of means, including a, a, a university issued um, photo ID. This gets to the live where they say they live part. And as other testifiers have said, this is a tried and true method to <coughs> satisfy that requirement in the law. It's just that not every single institution does it every single year. This will require, this will create rather a level playing field. It does put into place what is substantially already there by administrative rule and creates one uniform standard. So for the reasons that you just heard, uh, it's really uh, uh, pro security um, and pro election integrity as well. It will make for cleaner and more accurate lists and make it much easier for college students through something that is verified through their educational institution to show that they live where they say they live. Thanks for your time and attention. Thank you for your testimony. Are there any additional members of the public who wish to testify on this bill? Okay, uh, seeing none, we do have an amendment. Um, I guess maybe we could, we could take care of that now. Uh, Representative Quam, is that yours? Uh, yes, Mr. Chair. Okay, did you want to move the A1 amendment? Uh, Mr. Chair, I would like to move the A1 amendment. Um, the DE came late in the uh, the um, activity, and so I I believe uh, staff knows about a technical correction of the referencing, uh, you know, page line number. Just that. Sure, uh, Mr. Gehring, and uh, that would be fine. Uh, Mr. Chair, just to match up with the DE. Uh, draft um, the correction would be on line 1.2 of the amendment instead of the reference to page 1 line 17 it should be a reference to page 1 line 16 okay. uh, sure so, uh, thank you for that uh, is is there a severe warning severe weather warning I think it might be vacuuming oh okay severe, <laughs> severe vacuuming going on <laughs> um, okay <laughs> okay Fair enough. So uh, Mr. Gehring has explained the amendment um, 
And yeah, that that would be a technical amendment. I'd be fine with that. I think maybe just to put the <coughs> amendment in the shape you would like, Representative Quam, we should um, move and vote on the amendment, the, the amendment to the amendment. What's it? Or, 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 or is, could it be incorporated? Okay. Yeah, we can just incorporate that. So, so with that change, uh, you uh, please describe the A one. Thank you, Mr. Ahead. Chair. And you did pass the hearing test, <laughs> <laughs> detecting the the vacuum somewhere in the look, you know, around surrounding areas. Um, having somewhat been, you know, around and observant of, uh, you know, elections and activities, uh, remembering in college the um, actions to be able to register, I understand what the bill is doing, but I also understand other than uh, a blip when several hundred uh, uh, felons voted. There were several hundred convictions. Uh, most convictions, one of the largest contributing factors to uh, convictions with uh, uh, voting has been when college students have absentee voted or voted um, you know, early at another location back home and also voted uh, at the university, and I, I think um, I re recall one um, about 10 years ago where, where two students had done that. Uh, having been on a school board, it's not uncommon if there's a referendum or a local issue for parties to contact recent graduates to vote on a school referendum. And the intent of this amendment is to make sure there's uh, they're informed so they don't, uh, you know, violate the law, you know, that they're aware that you have to choose one or the other. Um, and since it is not, you know, un unheard of and we're probably going to get more college students voting, uh, the amendment is intended that uh, the institution lets the college students know that, hey, you've got, it's great, you can register and do the voting here, but you got to make sure that you only vote at the school or only vote at home. And that's the whole intent is uh, to have an informed electorate and preventing someone from, uh, you know, breaking the law. Thank you, Representative Quam. Uh, Representative Purcell, uh, did you have any comments to the amendment? Yes. Um, so this amendment, um, I I recommend a no vote on the amendment. Um, the bill and the list don't register anyone. What they do do is allow students to use their student ID in conjunction with the lists um, to register to vote on election day. Voting twice is already illegal and there are notices posted in every polling place to that effect, which is more effective than trying to spend money to mail out um, to students and each voter who registers under the section would be doing so in person on election day and would have to walk past the required posted notice. So uh, I recommend a no vote. Uh, it seems extra burdensome, costly and unnecessary to my mind. Mr. Chair, I'd like, Representative Kwong. I'd like to clarify um, what you're talking about the posting that's already existing. Um, if you look at and there aren't a lot of uh, convictions you know, for this felony, a substantial portion of those are from college students voting twice. Your bill is intended to increase the activity of, of college students voting. I just want to avoid there being an issue and um, I'm, I'm confused why informing would not be uh, you know, something that we should do. Having been a college student, uh, having had a son that was a college student, um, yeah, there are a lot of postings and things around and, and that, uh, but sometimes they still accidentally do something wrong. And I just thought it was prudent and it's not uh, you know, an egregious thing to to hey, once you know, just be careful, and you know, not doing this because I, I'd rather 
avoid having somebody make a mistake uh, in the hectic college life. Um, and that's, that's the full intent. So I, I, I wish members would support uh, having a more informed electorate and helping uh, kids avoid a mistake. Representative Greenman, did you have a comment? Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, and, um, and thank you, uh, Representative um, uh, Purcell, for really clarifying this. Um, it is intentionally voting at both home and campus is already a felony. Um, and I think that targeting just students for this um, is, um, is a bad idea. <laughs> and so I would, I would recommend that um, uh, I support your uh, decision to vote no, and I think that this would be uh, problematic to introduce into our code. All right, uh, seeing no further discussion, um, all those in favor of the A1 amendment with the incorporated change, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? No. No. Okay, uh, the amendment does not prevail. Um, discussion to the bill. Okay, uh, seeing none. Oh, I'm sorry, Representative Torkelson. Oh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I, you know, not being super familiar with uh, colleges and voting, uh, it's been a long time since I was there. Um, you mentioned earlier, you know, we certainly have a number of out of state uh, students that uh, will have a student ID and be part of this registration system. How does, I, and uh, I'm just trying to understand the mechanics of how those are handled. Uh, both by the college and by the uh, voting officials. Representative Purcell. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Lee Torkelson, for the question. Um, so uh, my understanding of the law that already exists is that you must reside in Minnesota for 20 days. Um, there are a number of folks. There are two colleges in my district, and I spent quite a bit of time at both of them, and um, a number of students said, I'm not voting in Minnesota, I'm voting absentee in my home state for whatever reason. Um, so what this bill does isn't, um, I'm not sure, I know uh, Representative Kwam mentioned that uh, he thought that this might increase voter turnout. I'm not sure that that's true. It's basically just sort of clarifying and codifying, codifying um, practices that are largely already done on campuses. So. Um, this is, is more clarifying in my mind than it is kind of uh, expanding. I heard one of the testifiers said expanding. I don't know that I see that happening. I think it removes the burden from the individual and provides that more in the institution to provide these housing lists predominantly. Representative Torkelson. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair. Yeah, my question is not about the expansion or, or the increase in voting. It's really the mechanics hmm. of, of these students that are uh, here in Minnesota legally and can vote in Minnesota, but also have the option to vote in their home state. Um, is, and we do have examples of students that have voted twice uh, for whatever reason, either misunderstanding or because they wanted to. Is there anything in this bill or in the current uh, mechanisms that are available that, that filter those out or somehow alert those students uh, to make sure that they're not voting? committing a felony. Uh, sorry, Representative Purcell. I'm not sure that I can answer that. That might be a Secretary of State question if I phone a friend, sure. the mechanics of that. You know, we, it's, Mr. Chair, it uh, seems the Secretary always skips out when I have a good <laughs> question. <laughs> but uh, we have very capable uh, yeah, assistance. Yes, very <laughs> capable staff. Uh, welcome to the committee. Please identify yourself for the record and uh, respond to the question. Thank you, Mr. Chair, uh, and Lee Torkelson, uh, Nicole Freeman, Office of the Secretary of State. Um, so currently, uh, and, and under this bill, um, uh, I before this hearing I looked at, we have a college student sort of handout um, that answers some <coughs> commonly asked questions uh, that students seem to have brought to our office in the past. And um, so uh, what that guidance is that our office has provided for, for several years is that um, if you uh, would like to sort of stake your residence as Minnesota, um, it's clear in, the, in that handout that you have to pick. Um, and so you pick uh, that you are a, you are, um, you know, living here. As Representative Purcell said, you've lived here for um, at least 20 days. You meet the other requirements to vote in Minnesota. Um, and that, you know, you pick whether you want to vote 
uh, in the other state, um, maybe where you grew up, uh, or you pick that you're gonna vote here in Minnesota. Um, and uh, I guess mechanically after the election, um, our county election staff run reports um, to look for double voting. Uh, and then if there are instances of double voting or um, you know, suspected double voting, that gets passed to county attorneys and local law enforcement for investigation. Well, well, thank you, Mr. Chair, but the, those double voting reports are strictly by state. Am I correct about that? So they wouldn't t actually catch any um, <coughs> multiple state offenses. Nicole Freeman? Uh, that's true. Um, right now in Minnesota, we don't compare with other states. Uh, Lee Torkelson? Thank you, Mr. Chair. So that's one point. Um, when a student decides to, you know, pick where they're gonna vote in any particular election, is that in force for a certain period of time or can they vote in Minnesota in a primary and then vote in their home state in, uh, in the general election? How is that, uh, what are the mechanics of that? Uh, Nicole Freeman. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Uh, so uh, similar to if someone moves um, in between a primary and a general, um, uh, there, there is, you know, someone can choose uh, where they are a resident um, for the last 20 days. If they've um, been a resident of the state of Minnesota, um, they could vote in the election. So if, um, I think you could take it as a student or as any person. Um, so if, if a, you know, much older person uh, lived in another state um, and, and uh, claimed residency in that state um, in August, uh, and voted in there, and that's when their primary was in that state, they could vote there. Uh, and if they moved and met residency requirements uh, under state statute in Minnesota, um, they could then vote in Minnesota in the prime, in the general in November. Uh, Representative Torkelson. I'm, thank you, Mr. <laughs> Chair. Now I'm getting even more confused. So, but students have that option to vote in their, at their home address where their parents live, for instance, or to vote at their college address, is, is that correct? Uh, Nicole Freeman, briefly. Thank you, uh, yes, that's correct. Um, given, it, it would depend where the student sort of feels that they uh, intend to return. Um, I think there's like 13 points in the definition of residence um, for uh, voter registration. I can't remember the citation off the top of my head, but um, it's sort of depending on how um, the person identifies, how that voter, how that prospective voter identifies um, and categorizes themselves. Um, some people come to Minnesota to come to school and intend to intend to remain here, and then there's other folks who, um, you know, change change their mind um, or intend to leave. So. Thank you. Representative Torkelson. Thank you. And so, Mr. Chair, and, and to the testifier, then does the student have that choice in every election? Can they jump back and forth at will? Uh, Nicole Freeman. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I don't believe there's anything in state statute that would prohibit someone from doing that. Thank you. Very interesting. Uh, Seeing no further, uh, Representative Greenman, briefly. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, and I just wanted to thank you for this bill and actually what this bill is about, which is, a because um, as, as an election, uh, I was an election observer a long time ago, um, an election challenger, and I was in a polling place in the University of Minnesota. And currently under Minnesota law, you can provide, you may provide this list. And as we heard from uh, uh, Mr. Stahlberger, oftentimes uh, universities do. But if they don't provide the list and a student shows up with their student ID card, which it says everywhere they can use if there's a list provided, they're not able to register uh, same day. And so what this does is provide consistency and it shows that if a student um, shows up, um, they're on the residential housing list, they have their voter ID, they know it doesn't, they're not gonna be on the whim of a, of a university official to provide that list. Um, and I think that that's really important in terms of the voter experience and providing, uh, providing consistent and uniform coverage um, for all students who um, Minnesota law already allows uh, folks to vote with a student ID and if the list has been provided. So uh, really appreciated that and just wanted to bring it back to uh, what this bill actually does. And I think it's a really good um, uh, fix that to your point uh, actually doesn't, um, it solidifies rights that in most cases are already being provided. Uh, thank you. Any closing remarks, uh, Representative Purcell? Um, I would just like to thank the testifiers who spent their Tuesday evening with us here in St. Paul. It's a good bill 
It's good policy. It provides an opportunity for students <coughs> to register and vote while at college, which is often difficult because they rarely possess both the identification and address verification required. This bill instead puts the onus of address verification on the post-secondary institution, which uh, generally maintain these address lists as a matter of course. So I encourage your support. Thank you. With that, Representative Purcell renews the motion that House File 495, as amended, be recommended to be re-referred to the Higher Education Finance and Policy Committee. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? No. The motion carries. Thank you, Representative Purcell. And finally, Representative Brand uh, is here. I will move, since he's not on the committee, I will move that House File 811 be laid over for possible inclusion in an omnibus bill. Um, and. Uh, Representative Brand, did you want us to move the DE1 amendment at this point? Uh, yes, Mr. Chair, members of the committee, can we please move uh, the DE1? Okay, I will move the DE1. Uh, that does make kind of a notable change to the bill, so maybe I'll just have you describe that before we uh, vote on it. Yeah, the, uh, the intent of the bill is to add a couple of words to the existing statute from 1988 when it was first enacted, but... Um, after having some other conversations, we also want to include in this conversation census workers. And so we have um, addressed that with the access required, limitations of the job. Um, there's some compliance issues with federal law, some applicability, and um, that that is what is required to also allow uh, census workers the um, the access that they need to do their jobs once every 10 years here in Minnesota. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so with that, uh, I, uh, the DE1 amendment is before us. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, motion carries. The bill's in the shape you would like. Representative Brand, uh, additional comments to your bill if you have any. Yeah, so House File 811 is a bill, as I, as I just mentioned, that really adds just a couple of words, well, with the exception of that amendment. That amendment added a couple more words, but um, to existing statute from 1988. So for many years, um, a campaign candidates uh, running for office um, door knocked. In fact, um, <laughs> door knocking has been employed in this country and across the world for many, many, many years. Um, since 1988, uh, 211B.20 was enacted to give direct contact with candidates and voters that live within a district and also live within a multi-housing, uh, multi-unit housing um, situation. Um, so there are three criteria laid out in statute. They must have a campaign committee under federal or state law. They must have a filed financial report and or um, I filed an affidavit of candidacy. I remember doing all those things, just as I'm sure you all have, uh, to get where we are today. Um, so I'm asking that we include the following online 2.22, or 2.2 rather, travel door to door to speak with individual residents and to, and then it's a continuation of what is already permitted under statute. Um, the amendment that we just adopted, as I mentioned, um, includes census employees and consideration of the work they must do to complete their task once every 10 years. Um, I have, actually I have a handout, if you don't mind. Um, I have a handout for members of the committee and there's some extras for the, for the public to also look at. Um, so I have what, in front of me, uh, Ramsey County. So Ramsey County, um, put on their website, uh, uh, County Attorney John Choi uh, put on their website campaign guidelines for candidates. And it specifically lays out what candidate access to multi-unit residential buildings for campaign purposes looks like under state statute. Um, and, and so uh, at the bottom of this, I, I'm sorry I should have handed this out right away, at the bottom of this first page, it says here specifically on the third bullet point, knock on doors of individual housing units and to leave campaign literature <laughs> under the doors except for nursing homes. This bill, the intent of the bill from 1990, uh, 1988 rather, was to allow for knocking door to door. Um, but in recent years, we've had some challenges to that when campaigns are, are actively campaigning. And so this, this change in law is, is a way to specifically lay out we're also going to address the door-to-door -door issue that we are seeing in campaigns. Um, 
So the legislation spells that, that, that there won't be any confusion going forward to the general public in multi-housing units, uh, dormitories, wherever that this, this bill particularly lays out. I do have a letter of support um, from the Minnesota Council of Foundations for the change, the amendment change that we made to allow census workers. And furthermore, I have a letter uh, dated uh, February 20th from Kyle Burnt at the uh, Minnesota Multi-Housing Association, and he says, I noticed that House File 811 has been posted for a hearing this week. Of course, it was last week, but of course, we had that blizzard, so right now we're doing it. Uh, the Minnesota Multi-Housing Association has reviewed this proposal and raised no objections to it. After review, we believe the proposal is <laughs> aligned, uh, aligning state statute with the original intentions and current general practices in many parts of the state. And so they, all, they also recognize that this was the, inter, in, uh, the original intention of the legislation and that it aligns with the current um, the way we do things as campaigns across our state. Um, and with that, I think I'll stop there. I can answer any questions. I don't know if anybody is here to testify, but, you know, we'll see. Yep. Thank you. We didn't have any members of the uh, sign up to testify in advance. Are there any members of the public who wish to testify on this bill? Okay. Uh, seeing none, uh, member discussion. And uh, those, if you could send those materials you mentioned to our committee oh, administrator. To, I sure can I mean, forward it. Yeah. After the committee, we can make sure it gets, they get to members as well. Absolutely. So, uh, any member comment questions? Uh, <laughs> okay, all right. Okay, I think uh, I think maybe from your perspective, uh, Representative Brand, you came at the right time. I think uh, <laughs> members are about ready to maybe get on with their evenings here. So, any closing remarks, Representative? I either Brand? knocked it out of the park, or I lulled you into submission to this one. But no, honestly, I think that this is a good opportunity for us. I really appreciate the opportunity to have this bill laid over for possible inclusion in the conversation going forward, you know, as we look at an omnibus bill. If you guys have any questions or anything you think of that we haven't thought about tonight, please reach out to me. Thank you, Representative Brand. This is an issue. I do appreciate you working on this. This is an issue um, I've heard about from several candidates um, who have been denied access and I think this the clarification will help and I think the addition of census workers will fulfill an important um, objective as well. Yeah. So with that, I will renew the motion that House File 811 as amended be laid over for possible inclusion in an omnibus bill. Omnibus bill. The bill is laid over. Um, so uh, members, uh, we have another hearing tomorrow morning at 8.30. Thank you, Representative Brand. Um, and uh, with that, seeing no questions, just want to drag it out and make it extra painful for you. Uh, we are adjourned. Thank you.